we were rolling in through a forest of snow-covered pines. The north of Poland seemed to be very sparsely populated. We had passed only a few small towns. Suddenly, well ahead of the train, I caught sight of the figure running along beside the tracks. I didn't think I could be the only person who had noticed him, but apparently no one in any of the cars ahead was doing anything about him. Rapidly, I maneuvered my Mauser into a good position and took aim. It could only be a terrorist. Our train was moving very slowly, a perfect target for a bomb. In a few minutes, I was level with the man. I couldn't see anything unusual about him. He was probably a Polish woodcutter who had come up out of curiosity. I felt disconcerted. I had been all ready to fire, and now nothing seemed to justify it. I aimed deliberately over his head and pulled the trigger. The report shook the air, and the butt of my gun crashed violently into my shoulder. The poor fellow took off as fast as he could, obviously fearing the worst, and I felt certain that my ill-considered action had made another enemy for the Reich. The train maintained its speed, and a few minutes later Laos appeared, continuing his endless patrol despite the cold. He gave me a curious look. We had decided to take duty in shifts. While two of us watched, the third would try to warm up under the canvas. We had now been on the train for something like eight hours and felt apprehensive about the night, which would undoubtedly be spent in these conditions. Twenty minutes ago, I had taken Halls's place and for twenty minutes had been unable to control my violent shivering. Night was drawing close. Perhaps Minsk was too. The train was moving along the only track. To the north and to the south, we were enclosed by dark forest. For the last quarter of an hour, the train had been accelerating, which would undoubtedly result in our deaths by freezing. We had also consumed a large part of our rations to keep on. Suddenly, the train slowed down. The brake blocks grated against the wheels, and the couplings shook violently. We were soon moving at the speed of a bicycle. I saw the front of the train turn to the right. We were diverting onto a secondary track. The train moved forward for another five minutes, and then stopped. The two officers had jumped down from one of the front cars and were walking back. Lausk and two other non-coms were out to meet them. They conferred for a moment, but didn't tell us anything. All along the train, people were looking out. The forest seemed a likely haven for terrorists. Our train had been standing still for several minutes when we heard the distant sound of wheels. We were walking up and down, trying to warm ourselves up, when a blast from the whistle, accompanied by gestures, indicated that we should return to our post at once. A locomotive appeared in the distance on the track we had just left. It was entirely blacked out. What I saw next froze me with horror. I wish I were a writer of genius so that I could do justice to the vision which appeared before us. First, we saw a car loaded with railway materials, pushed along in front of the locomotive and hiding its dim lights. Then came the smoking locomotive, its tender and a closed car with a hole in its roof to accommodate a short length of smoking pipe. Probably the train kitchen. Behind this, another car with higher railings carried armed German soldiers. A twin-mounted machine gun covered the rest of the train, which consisted simply of open flat cars like ours, but loaded with a very different kind of freight. The first one of these to pass, my uncomprehending eyes seemed to be carrying a confused heap of objects, which only gradually became recognizable as human bodies. Directly behind this heap, other people were clinging together, crouching or standing. Each car was full to the bursting point. One of us, more informed than the others, told us in two words what we were looking at. Russian prisoners. Hollis looked at me. Except for the burning red spots made by the cold, his face was as white as a sheet. Did you see that? he whispered. They've piled up their dead to shield themselves from the wind. 
In my stupefaction, I could only reply with something like a groan. Every car was carrying a shield of human bodies. I stood as if petrified by the horror of the sight rolling slowly by. Faces entirely drained of blood and bare feet stiffened by death and cold. The tenth car had just passed us when something even more horrible happened. Four or five bodies slid from the badly balanced load and fell to the side of the track. The funeral train did not stop. A group of officers and non-coms from our train walked over to investigate. Driven by I don't know what element of curiosity, I jumped down from our car and went over to the officers. I saluted and asked in a faltering voice if the men were dead. An officer looked at me in astonishment and I realized that I had just abandoned my post. He must have noticed my confusion as he didn't reprimand me. I think so, he said sadly. You can help your comrades bury them. Then he turned and walked away. House had come with me. We went back to our car to fetch shovels and again to dig a trench a short distance above the embankment. Laos and another fellow looked through the dead men's clothes to try to find some identification. I learned later that most of these poor devils had no civilian identity. Hollis and I needed all of our nerve to drag two of them over to the ditch without looking at them. We were covering them with dirt when the departure whistle blew. He was growing colder by the minute. I felt overcome by a vast sense of disgust. An hour later, our train passed through a double hedge of stretchers which, despite the absence of light, we could see were more or less destroyed. We passed another train, less sinister than the preceding one, but scarcely comforting. Its cars were marked with red crosses. Through some of the windows we could see stretchers, which must have been carrying badly wounded men. At other windows, soldiers swathed in bandages were waiting to us. Finally, we arrived at Mint Station. Our train pulled to a stop down the whole length of a long, wide platform, covered with a busy, motley crowd. Armed soldiers and soldiers in fatigues, civilians and groups of Russian prisoners, cord in hand by other prisoners, who wore red and white armbands and carried truncheons. These were the informers who had denounced the famous People's Commissars, and were therefore anti-communist. They claimed the right of guarding their comrades, which suited our authorities very well, as no one would be more likely to get a decent day's work from the Russian prisoners. We could hear orders being given, first in German, then in Russian. A crowd of men came up to our train, and the unloading began and the lights of the trucks parked along the platform. We joined in this work, which took the better part of two hours, warming ourselves a little, then plunging once more into our provisions. Haas, a greedy guts, had consumed more than half his allotment in less than two days. We spent the night in a large building where we were able to sleep in a certain degree of comfort. The next day we were sent to a military hospital where we were kept for two days and given a series of shots. Minsk was very badly damaged. There were many gutted houses and walls, cross-hatched by machine-gun fire. Some of the streets were totally impassable, with a continuous line of shell holes and bomb craters, often more than 15 feet deep. Passageways of a sword had been made by planks and other solid objects thrown across this chaos. From time to time we gave way to a Russian woman, loaded with provisions, and always followed by four or five children who stared at us with astonishingly round eyes. Life for the troops in this sector was remarkably well organized. Mail was distributed, there were films for soldiers on leave which we were not allowed to attend, libraries and restaurants run by Russian civilians that reserved entirely for German soldiers. The restaurants were all too expensive for me and I never went into them but Hulls, who would sacrifice anything for a good stuffing, spent all his money in these places, and a certain amount of ours, too. 
We were much better fed than we had been in Poland and were able to supplement our rations very cheaply, which we really needed to do. The cold in these opening days of December had become extremely sharp, dropping to more than five degrees below zero. The snow, which fell in great abundance, never melted, and in places was already over three feet deep. That is the point we had reached in December 1942. We spent our time now shuttling away snow so that our trucks could move forward 15 or 20 miles in the morning, but only to find our efforts covered over again the same day. The earth beneath the snow was a sinister relief of bumps and potholes, which we tamped down or blew up. In the evenings we scrambled to find shelter for the night. After a while of this, I was beginning to feel that I had had more than enough of Holy Russia. Like everybody else, I was afraid of the idea of being under fire, but I was also beginning to long to use the Mauser, which had been dragging around with me for what seemed like an eternity, without ever being the slightest use. I felt that somehow firing at something would avenge me for my sufferings from the cold and for my blisters. My hands were badly blistered from shoveling, and my woolen gloves were already full of holes, exposing the tops of my icy fingers. My hands and feet felt the cold so sharply that it sometimes seemed as if the pain were stabbing me in the heart. The thermometer remained around five degrees below zero.